What is Snowflake? And obviously, no, I don't mean the things that fall from the sky. I mean the data platform, also known as Snowflake. Now, about two years ago, I did a video about why everyone likes Snowflake, but I'd say it's more philosophical, where I talked about kind of why Snowflake became popular. And I never really talked too much in depth in terms of like what Snowflake is, in terms of how it operates, or some of the functionality that it offers that really does differentiate the way we approach data engineering and data warehousing compared to what we did, or at least what I did, uh, about 10 years ago. So in this video, I actually want to dive a little deeper into Snowflake and how it works technically, and also why it just changed how we operate, like some of the benefits that we get from using similar solutions, right? Like Snowflake's not alone in this case. There are plenty of other uh, cloud-based data platforms and data warehouses that provide a lot of benefits from being, again, cloud-based. So let's dive into what is Snowflake and how it operates now. So let's start with the fact that Snowflake at its core, its core functionality that it offers, and I say functionality uh, because there are people that would disagree with this, is a data warehouse. Again, at its core, the functionality that it offers, the thing it first did was let you build a data warehouse in the cloud. But of course, again, I, I say functionally because there are people who will argue that from a purely technical definition standpoint, it's not a data warehouse, or at least its core services aren't really a data warehouse. But again, from a functional standpoint, people build their data warehouses on it. Now, since then, it has massively expanded to offer tons more services. And now that is one of the reasons it specifically tries to ensure that when people talk about it, it is referred to as a cloud data platform because it doesn't just offer, uh, again, the separated storage and compute situation that we'll dive into. It also offers all of this other functionality, things like data sharing and Snowpipe, and we'll go into that later. But all of this other functionality that because, again, it's in the cloud, because it was built on top of things like AWS or, or GCP, it has offered a lot of benefits in how it can integrate and operate a lot of your various workflows. So since then, it kind of has expanded and become more of this cloud data platform. The concept to understand about Snowflake is the fact that it has taken this hybrid approach to how it's actually designed. Typically, at least if you're accustomed to a lot of the database systems we've used in the past, most databases have this shared nothing architecture. Basically, a shared nothing architecture, like the name suggests, refers to the fact that when you have a distributed database system, that each node does not share any of its various components with the others, right? Uh, it's going to have its own CPU, its own storage, its own memory, and all that will be, again, consolidated in one. Whereas uh, Snowflake took a more hybrid approach, what they call a multi-cluster shared architecture. Basically, they're trying to get the benefits of both worlds, where in one case, they have a shared disk architecture that uses a central data repository for persisted data that is accessible from all compute nodes in the platform. But similar to a shared nothing architecture, Snowflake processes queries using um, MPP, massively parallel processing, uh, compute clusters where each node in the cluster stores a portion of the entire data set locally. This approach offers the data management simplicity of a shared disk architecture while also balancing the performance uh, and scale out benefits of a shared nothing architecture. So you're trying to get the best of both worlds. And the other benefit here is the separation of storage and compute. So if you're accustomed to your traditional databases, especially like in my world where I did a ton of SQL Server work. Actually, now I'm still doing a bunch of SQL Server to Snowflake migrations. Whenever you ran jobs in SQL Server, right, like, there would be times that you had to literally go and look at, okay, what's running because something is blocking um, all these other jobs from running. And so you have to go in there and figure out if you have to kill a query, not because it was going to cost you a lot of money, which we'll talk about later with Snowflake, but because of the fact that you were just running out of compute, right? Like you only had a limited amount of compute on your database and you couldn't expand it. You couldn't go and say like, hey, go find some more compute somewhere. Even if you had a different server, you had to just kind of go with it. You kind of have to say like, okay, we got to let this job run and we can't have another job run at the same time because it's just too big. But that's one of the benefits you get with a separated storage and compute model where Snowflake has storage that essentially is store is one component, you'll usually see it in the picture, where storage is separated out because it's usually essentially stored in something like S3 uh, or a similar cloud service, depending which cloud provider you pick. And then its compute is separated out. And so what they call compute, they also reference as virtual warehouses. So you can spin up essentially an endless amount of virtual warehouses to run on that storage, right? Because they're not connected. So if you want to run a thousand queries on that same data set, it really doesn't matter because those 1000 virtual warehouses that you've spun up don't impact each other. You will uh, obviously pay for it. And we'll talk about that when we talk about Snowflake credits and how you pay 
for Snowflake, but it does give you this benefit of being able to set up a new virtual warehouse when you want to run another job, or maybe you need to run a bigger job. And again, they have t-shirt sizing. So you hear that t-shirt sizing is basically small, medium, extra large, etc. If you have a bigger job that just occasionally needs to run, you can just have a virtual warehouse that is big and a virtual warehouse that is extra small usually. And that way you get the benefits of having a really fast, maybe very expensive uh, compute instance run uh, on a very big job while normally having a smaller instance that's a little slower run for smaller jobs. You couldn't do this again in the world before where if everything is connected, you've only got whatever compute instance your database has, you're stuck with whatever it is, right? Like if you need more compute, if you want to run a query faster, you better be a better engineer essentially. So there is some, some, I think loss there where it's like you can essentially cheat, right? You could argue that in some cases it's actually not a bad idea. You could make an argument, as one of my friends often said, uh, that instead of maybe hiring an extra two engineers to try to improve your performance on Snowflake, let's say it's really slow. And let's say you're only spending, only spending, let's say $75,000 on Snowflake a year. And you think it would take you two more engineers to improve the performance. I mean, it's a lot, but it's a, just for this example, it might be worth just to increase the size of your data warehouse to increase performance instead of hiring those two engineers. So um, just that argument uh, that I always found kind of funny. All right, I do wanna do a quick dive into kind of understanding how Snowflake credits and pricing in general works because it is something that can be a little confusing and concerning for people who are trying to decide is Snowflake right for me. And the basic way I'd understand Snowflake, in particular, the compute side of Snowflake, when you're doing pay per usage, because obviously, as per most products, they offer multiple methods of paying, uh, you can pay per usage, you can also sign up for contracts, although usually with contracts, they will give you a better what they call like cost per credit hour, or at least cost per credit, and then we'll talk about how those credits are consumed by the hour. But you have to hit a certain price. I do need to confirm that, but originally it was like 25. Uh, I recently heard 40. If someone wants to confirm that in the comments below, that'd be great. But you have to be spending a decent amount to actually sign up for a contract, which gives you a slightly better cost per credit. Now, again, this is compute. And again, you pay for storage and compute separately, or at least in separate methods. Um, so let's talk a little bit more on compute. Now, if you go on Snowflake's website, what you'll see is you pay a certain amount per credit. Now, uh, the baseline is generally about $3. There are some possibilities that it might be different depending where you live, depending on AWS regions. But for me, most of the time it's been $3 per credit. And then the next part you need to look at is this chart here, which is virtual warehouse sizes and essentially how much credits are consumed per hour. So what you'll see is at the very smallest, you're spending one credit per hour, which what that means is if you turn on Snowflake, it's almost like electricity, you can think about it. If you turn on Snowflake, so you Snowflake auto suspends in general, if you're not using it, there is a way you can set how long before it auto suspends. There's a whole article about how if you leave uh, the auto suspend at the default setting, it'll run for 10 minutes and then you'll end up spending a million plus dollars on your Snowflake compute, which there's a good article about how I saved my company 500K accidentally. So like I said, Snowflake, will charge you after you turn it on. So you run a query, essentially turns on the warehouse. It's like, hey, I'm on. And it charges you for how long you leave it essentially on. Again, like a light in your house. And you'll, again, going back to that chart, uh, if you're on extra small, it will be one credit an hour. And actually I've seen a few instances where people have actually pushed it to be exactly 24 credits in a day or about that as it floated around like 22 and 24 because they would have the extra small data warehouse running all day because they had some real time stuff set up. And so it was literally running all day and it made sense, right? Like you paid 24 credits in a day because there's, you pay for every hour that it's running. You don't pay for the entire hour just for hitting it once. You only pay for the time used in that hour and you'll pay for fractions essentially of a credit. But eventually if you are running it for 24 hours, you will pay for 24 credits, which means you then take that 24, multiply it by three, $3 or whatever the base rate is for your credit rate, which is $72, which in the end, you'll end up spending about 2000 some dollars in a month. And that's if you're running one extra small. Now, there are a few things that you can add in there. You can actually let it scale. If you want to have another compute engine essentially spin up just in case like, hey, we have so many queries that this one compute instance is running out of space, it'll spin up another one. And in theory, then you can have two compute engines, you can think about it, or two warehouses is what they call it. And in theory, if you were running both of those for uh, 24 hours, you'd be paying for two extra smalls, not just one. And then now you're paying, instead of 72, you're paying 144. 
and, and so on and so forth. And then as the warehouses, the compute get bigger, you go through more credits faster. So at a small, you're at two credits uh, per hour. So now you're paying $6 essentially per hour is another way you can think about it. Again, this is all based off that initial rate. If you're a medium, it's four. So now you're paying uh, $12 and so on and so forth. And it's all essentially you can think about by hour and you're paying for fractions of that hour if you're not using it for the whole hour. Don't worry, they're not gonna charge you for a whole hour if you only run it for one minute. They'd love to, but they won't. On the other side, the other part that you pay for is storage. That's generally considerably simpler. At least currently, uh, when I checked, it's still the same $23 a terabyte. So every terabyte you have is about $23. And if you happen to go and try to pick Snowflake, they'll actually walk you through a lot of this and help you try to figure out um, the right pricing because they want to get you on that contract because they want to get paid ahead of time. So that's the general idea of how uh, Snowflake credits kind of work. Hopefully that's helpful in understanding. Again, the simplest way to think about it is it's electricity. And if you leave your light on, you pay for it. So turn off your light, make sure your default set correctly. All right, let's keep going. Now, another point to be called out about how Snowflake actually stores the data that I think is important is the fact that it uses what they call micropartitions. Now, this was something that I recall back from, I think it was like 2017 or 2016, I sat uh, in a Snowflake either meetup or something. Uh, I think I thought it was a data meetup, but it was definitely more of a sales pitch of Snowflake. Um, but they were talking about micropartitions. This is one of the big things they wanted to highlight back then. Again, this was when they really mostly focused on what they offered in terms of their functionality as a data warehouse and running queries and running analytical queries. And essentially, uh, the way Snowflake operates is it stores each set of data as you store it um, in a columnar fashion in what they call micropartitions. These micropartitions usually sit in a 50 to 500 megabyte range of uncompressed data specifically. And Snowflake does this automatically, right? Like this is all behind the scenes where it will just run and, and micropartition your data for you. While it's also doing that, it's gathering metadata on those micro partitions. So it kind of understands the minimum and maximum of these columns, because again, they're storing them as columns. So that way, when uh, it runs your query, it can do some partition pruning, which essentially lets it skip, you know, like cut out certain data, right? Like if, if it goes and runs a query and says like, hey, let's look at this data set and it sees that there's, you know, the minimum and maximum don't meet some where clause that you're running, it can avoid running any query on that data before it brings it back to actually do its calculations. And what is really beneficial here is a lot of this is done without you knowing. And that's kind of one of the benefits of Snowflake and again, a lot of cloud data warehouses is they have tried to abstract or at least simplify what we have done as data engineers and data warehouse uh, professionals for a long time and instead of again you having to sit there and wonder hey when should I run a certain job because if I run one big job you're just gonna bump into another one or I'm gonna walk a table a lot of that has been mitigated away right like a lot of that has been allocated to essentially snowflake figuring it out same thing with even how it's storing the data with micro partitions, right? There aren't indexes on snowflake there are cluster keys which can be used to improve performance but it's not the same as indexes where you could essentially build a good amount of indexes if you really wanted to for again there are pros and cons there but you could build those indexes the way you wanted and multiple ones on one table which could give you performance benefits for multiple different queries they have tried to again get a lot of the benefits via how they store the data via micro partition as well as again with cluster keys now at this point you should have a general understanding of kind of what snowflake is and a little bit of how it you, compares to what you might have used in the past again if you are a sql server person or a postgres person you can kind of see that there is a difference i think there are use cases for a lot of different data warehouses and databases and again there's always an argument to be made that sql server again doesn't fit in the data warehouse model either because it is generally a transactions database again but that's a, again a different different conversation uh, that i've actually had uh, with a vp of data uh, i say conversation it was definitely a little bit of an argument where we argued whether um certain things were data warehouses or not basically does it have to be a logical thing a physical thing in terms of or where the definition of a data warehouse starts and ends but i want to talk about some of the other features of snowflake because i think especially early on what snowflake did i like to say they've lost the plot a little called them out recently on linkedin post kind of jokingly as they poke very heavily at Databricks. But I think the thing that made Snowflake really stand out early on was the fact that they understood the data person and the problems that they face. And that is represented in some of their features, including, we're going to talk about some of them now, uh, things like data sharing. If you know, or if you've seen the video about me talking about SFTP, you know it's really common for companies to share data uh, in between each other. I mean, I'm talking about billions of rows of data, probably trillions of rows of data being shared in between companies daily or at least monthly. I worked for companies where basically we handled half the US's population of data of healthcare claims. Like we would just process all of it via SFTP. And that happens for tons of different industries, finances, HR, all of these industries 
send data via SFTP. And it's a very uh, laborious process where you have to, you know, pass a schema file. You have to be like, hey, company B, what data are you going to send this? Okay, this is the format. This is the data types. Send me a PGP key. Send me whatever encryption information I need. Send me a password and a username for the SFTP that I'm going to sign into or however I'm going to sign into your SFTP. When will you load it? How, you know, are you pushing it or pulling it? Are you pushing it to my SFTP? Am I pulling it from your SFTP? What's going on here, right? You go throughout this process. They create a SQL query. They parse out that data. They'd pull out that data from their database, push it to your SFTP. You'd push it into yours. So you have like multiple copies of the CSV hanging around. You have multiple copies of the same data set hanging around. And tons of companies are still doing this. And it's not going away anytime soon. I always hope that it will, but it's not. Snowflake saw that. At least that's what I think happened. Um, as well as like all the API connections. And we're like, what if we did data sharing? So we're already in the cloud. Let's just make it really easy for you company A, who is our customer, to share with company B. Like, let's just make that really easy. And really, it's just a couple SQL commands for data sharing that you can set up to create a data share and now send data uh, without any copy of data. It's called zero copy. They call it zero copy of data because, again, that data just exists somewhere. And you can just now query it like you would any other bit of information from your Snowflake instance. It's great for Snowflake because it makes their product a little stickier because you have to be a Snowflake to Snowflake connection. I think in the future, they'll make that broader, especially with Iceberg. They'll have to because everyone else will. But currently, it creates a very sticky uh, version of the product because you have to have Snowflake on both ends. Um, and it makes it very easy just to share data. Like, hey, now you have access to this table um, or view that we've built without having to do all that SFTP and process. Now, instead of sometimes spending months, it, it would be months between like, Obviously, some people signing paperwork and then someone's sick or something on the other team. So they didn't set up the SFTP job. Now it's a few commands. Um, that's a process and it's, it's much easier. So I always think that's something that's very cool that Snowflake did. Another very useful feature to me has always been Snowpipe. Essentially, Snowpipe is a continuous ingestion uh, service that Snowflake has that allows you to load data as it's generally, at least in my use cases that I've used, dropped in something like S3 immediately, right? Like it's dropped into S3. You go through the process of essentially setting up a connection via uh, AWS. You have to go through some IAM uh, policy setup that creates this connection between Snowflake and it, your AWS instance and let them access your S3 instance. And then Snowflake is just essentially sitting there waiting for CSVs to drop from certain locations that you can then immediately integrate um, into your workflows. And there's a lot of little things like that that Snowflake has that are just like integrations automatically to other cloud services that make it very easy, right? Like you can query directly from S3, you can set up tasks. There's a ton of little things along the way that are very beneficial. Uh, tasks. Tasks are one of those things that I, they're slowly making better and better. Snowflake tasks are essentially what we used to do, right? Like if you have worked uh, in the tech world for a while, people would set up a bunch of stored procedures that would run at certain times. Usually you'd have to have an outside script run it or something like a SQL Server agent. And now Snowflake's like, well, you can just create a task that runs at a certain time and actually start setting up dependencies. They don't have a great UI. So that's, I think, usually the issue is like you have to do a lot of it through SQL. But I think they're slowly pushing into adding a new layer onto Snowflake tasks. Uh, I think they're maybe trying to not run into some of their partners currently, but they should just add a UI to it so that it's very easy. And then hopefully in the future, you can have like Python and SQL tasks all in one place uh, and you can actually make it easy to backfill have some variables there's a ton of extra layers that they need to add to it that they don't currently have but in its current form it it's, it makes a lot of sense if you have very simple uh, data tables to build that you could just use snowflake tasks as a very simple place to start i say that because if you're doing like two or three layers it starts getting very hairy i'd only use it if you have like one layer of tables you know you need to make and there are very few people that kind of fit that criteria but those are things that i think snowflake has done well in the past that really answer a lot of problems that us data people face. Going forward, I think they kind of need to refine what they are and who they are. Um, that's a different issue, right, um, in terms of marketing and product. But that's what Snowflake is, right? Again, it is not just a data warehouse. It really is this cloud data platform that allows you to run your analytical queries. There are, again, tons of other options. I don't want anyone to ever think uh, just because I talk about a solution, it's the only option. You can look at Databricks, you can look at BigQuery. Not a fan of Amazon Redshift still, sorry. Bad taste in my mouth, probably forever, um, since that's where I started and like most people just got tired of doing some of the workarounds for that. But I'm sure they're making strides as well, so don't count them out either. But there are plenty of good options out there. If you're looking for a cloud data platform that can run your analytical queries. With that, guys, I wanna say thanks so much for watching this video and I'll see y'all in the next one. Thanks all, goodbye.